All right, everybody. This is the, uh, the webinar on the dirty little secrets of financial aid and scholarships. Let me just uh, switch over to the camera here. Ken, how do I do that? Hmm. My name is, uh, is Andy Lockwood, and <clears throat> it looks like uh, the chat is uh, is working. Um, hopefully, if you can see me on the screen, um, Pearl is uh, is manning or womaning the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. We're going to be taking a couple of different breaks during the um, during the presentation uh, just to make sure that um, I'm getting to as many questions as I possibly can. And um, the issue is that there were, uh, I think we had about 156 or 157 people um, register for this uh, for this presentation. So um, there's no way I'm going to be able to get to all the questions. Uh, and I got a whole bunch of them this morning, you know, long after I started, you know, getting ready for this uh, presentation. It may not look like it takes preparation, but it really does. So um, we're going to start. And um, like I said, uh, just you know, if you're in the chat room, say hi to Pearl. She'll, uh, she'll say hi back to you there and just let us know that uh, that you're there. So let me, how do I do this? I'm going to start sharing my screen. Bear with me. Okay, just, just see that behind the scenes here. It's a little, a little hard sometimes to... Uh, to, to, to do this because there's a little bit of a delay. But um, here we are, Dirty Little Secrets of Financial Aid and Scholarships. If you guys can um, see my screen, just tell me. Uh, that, that includes you, Pearl, off camera. Okay. So today, here's what we're going to do. We are going to cover how to get more money for college. Hello. So you can send your kid to the college he deserves or increasingly she deserves, and especially in our family. But I'm already getting I'm already getting sidetracked. Sorry, Pearl. Uh, so you don't have to eat mac and cheese or brown bag all of your meals for the next ten years. Nothing against mac and cheese. Um, Kraft neither approves nor disapproves of this presentation, but I think you get the point. Just in case you don't, let me connect the dots. The less you spend on college, the more you have for retirement. The more you have for paying off the mortgage, if you have some sort of crazy dream like that. Uh, you could also, you know, maybe do some cool stuff like, you know, buying a second home, taking some vacations, restaurants, go, you know, going out to eat it's at places that don't serve only mac and cheese, who knows, a boat, whatever. But instead of what, um, you know, I just want to point out what's not going to happen today before we get into the presentation, I cannot expertise you in the next 45 minutes. Um, I can't promise you that you're going to get a full ride at every college that you apply to. Um, I also want to emphasize to you that, that we're not an infomercial, and this is not a, um, we're not producing an infomercial, and this is not some kind of sales pitch. This is a class. It's educational, and like I said, there's uh, 150, 160 people or so who are registered for the live um, presentation. I'm sure we'll pick up another, you know, 40 or 50 um, other viewers on the replay if history proves to be accurate. My point is, is that even if uh, everyone on this on this presentation wanted to hire me, we couldn't take them on. We're a very small shop, and um, even more important, we're not right for everybody. And our our approach, you know, I of course am egotistical and narcissistic enough to think that our approach is you know the best, but I'm also realistic. Uh, we are not right for everybody, and I'll get into that a little bit at the end if we have time. But I just want to point out to you what we're not doing today. All right. Here is the, and I, I use this slide a lot in my live presentations. So if you've seen me live, um, some of this will be review, but about 25 or 30 percent is uh, is new content that I either have just developed or I don't usually get ch a chance to talk about live. This happens to be the regulatory scheme behind the FAFSA, which is the main uh, financial aid form that every college takes. It's a federal form, and um, the bad news is that this is the simplified version. Uh, can everyone see this? Pearl, can you see this? Because we're on a delay? OK. Um, the good news is that, um, is that we're going to teach you how to navigate this and the important stuff, and more importantly, how to use this information so that you can avoid overpaying for college. 
Um, if you're wondering, you know, many people on this on this presentation are, are new to um, to our uh, email list. Um, why should you pay attention? Why should you care? Who the hell are we? Uh, that's me and Pearl. It's not Beauty and the Beast. Um, uh, <laughs> who I wrote, um, ju I just uh, wrote and, um, and finished off and published a book on admissions called The Incomparable Applicants. And uh, last year, I had come out with a book on financial aid called How to Pay Wholesale for College. Each book made it to uh, number one bestseller in a couple different categories, which was pretty cool. Pearl and I are college finance and admissions consultants. We're in Long Island. We have, um, we have clients all over the world. I was going to say all over the country, but all over the world. And um, the most important thing is, uh, before I leave my favorite topic here, me, is that uh, you know I'm in this in this field because of my own uh, pretty rough experiences with student loans. And um, our mission really is to make sure that none of you or your kids goes through anything like we went through. You know, one, one of the things I say on my website is, uh, you know, Pearl and I swore a blood oath to each other that um, no, that our kids wouldn't go through this. And I, I recently had uh, a, a guy ask me if the blood oath was, you know, an official uh, ceremony. Was it real blood? <laughs> it was kind of, kind of a wise ass, but of course he felt like for some strange reason that I would appreciate that. All right, so <clears throat> let's give a little bit of uh, background. So, so college costs have skyrocketed and and it's not just a vague sweeping statement it's a it's a real fact if you compare the cost of college with other indices like the cost of living which has gone up 300 percent healthcare which has gone up 700 percent college costs have gone up 1000 percent over the last uh, 26 or 27 years so it's it's very real it's just not talked about that much in the media for some strange reason student loan statistics are pretty nuts there's a, a, a over a trillion dollars of student loans out there, which does not, by the way, include parent loans. I don't have a number for parent loans. I don't. I don't know why I can't find it. Um, most kids, on average, get out with thirty-three thousand dollars worth of debt. But you know, there are people who get out of grad school with three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. So these these numbers are even scarier. Uh, the backstory is even scarier than than what I think we see here in these statistics. Roughly one of eleven student loans are in default. And student debt is the number one reason cited, um, I saw a, a report by a, a realtor, um, it's the number one reason cited for delaying the purchase of a home. It's the number one reason cited for um, not being able to start a business. So it's not just that there's a lot of debt out there, it's what is preventing us as a country from being able to accomplish. And unless it gets you know addressed soon, and I don't really, this, this workshop is not about you know, congressional or legislative type uh, ideas and proposals. Um, what I'm concerned with is helping everyone here on this presentation avoid student le student loans and being crushed by this as much as I can. Even if I help just one of you guys, uh, I'll consider it successful. Other trends in college planning, 43% of, of people graduate in four years, only 43%. And 42% never graduate at all, which is really scary. There's a lot of people who start and stop. 80% of kids switch majors, which is a big deal if you consider that it adds to the length of time that you spend in college, which not only will cost you more money, let's say you're, you're in college another year or two, it's forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year maybe, just to use a round number, but you're also not working in those two years. <clears throat> so that's another $40,000 or something. That's close to a $200,000 problem that this presentation hopefully will help you see that there's a, a way to avoid that. That's something that Pearl and I do on a, on a daily basis for our clients, help them solve that near-term $200,000 problem and help them get into colleges that are gonna help them <clears throat> achieve success in the 40 years after college. We're more concerned, frankly, with the next 40, not four years. And the last stat here is 46% of college grads are employed in jobs that do not require a college degree within two years of graduating. And that is an old stat. That was graduating the, the cohort, you know, people who started in 2007. So they finished off in, in roughly 2011 or 2012. I'm not sure exactly how the study goes. I just know that it's old. So I expect that number to, to really uh, grow, sadly. So let's go over some of these dirty little secrets. Colleges award money based on financial need and on merit, which are both loaded terms, which we will explore. 
there's actually more merit funding available than there is need based and that that's a shift that happened sometime in the late 90s as college became more um, aware of, of what each other each other college was doing because colleges compete with one another and that is a secret secrets in, a, in quotes because if you thought about it you would realize it but a lot of kids and parents are too bogged down thinking about well what am I going to do to get in they're coming up with all sorts of tactics like taking the SAT five times the ACT five, you know four times um, running track when they hate to sweat all these type of tactics in order to quote unquote make themselves look better for college however the um, the problem or the 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 other side of the coin that you're ignoring is that colleges want the kids just as badly as the kids want to get in so that's a dirty little secret and um, the last comment here I sort of alluded to this already is that um, need and merit quote unquote are in the eye of the beholder in the eye of the financial aid office it's not so clear cut even though we're going to talk about how the formulas work and other other facts I always I want to point out that there's a lot of gray area Let's talk about <clears throat> some of the myths and urban legends about financial aid. So, number one, by the way, if you're in the chat room and you have questions, Pearl is going to, at some point, she's going to aggregate them and, and start uh, passing them over to me. But if you want, just you know, let us know that you're in and you, uh, you're, you're, you're paying attention and let us know that you're awake. I don't know how many are actually in the, in the chat room now. Is it, how many people, Pearl? No? What? Talk to me. Yeah. You can't see anyone? That's odd because we have a lot of people on. Okay. Well, then there's something wrong with the chat. I think that's the problem. Um, email Pearl. If you, can't, uh, if you can't see the chat, if you're not communicating with her, her email address is pearl at andylockwood.com. Pearl, P-E-A-R-L, at andylockwood.com. And I'll, I'll repeat that uh, a couple times uh, throughout here. So let's talk about the um, financial aid myths and urban legends. So number one, financial aid is only for low-income families. In fact, or, or people who don't earn six figures. In fact, most aid goes to families in the top quartile of income. So that you know that that's kind of counterintuitive, kind of odd. For most people, but um, the reason that this happens is because colleges would rather give out a little bit of money to a family that can afford to pay them, as opposed to a whole lot of money to a low-income family. And I don't mean to be um, non-politically correct or, you know, controversial that way. That's I'm just telling you how it is. So that's why that's a myth. Uh, myth number two is the forms are straightforward and easy to fill out. That's actually a partial myth. Um, they are easy to fill out, but the problem is that there's a lot of overly complicated uh, rules and regulations behind the forms that can make it uh, very difficult to do. So anyone can fill out a form just the same way that anyone could probably buy a book on plumbing and do their own plumbing or tax returns or, you know, you, <laughs> I mean, if you look at a 1040, particularly the 1040 EZ, you know, the easy tax return, you would see that it's not that intimidating, but, you know, there are even, you know, I told you before, there's 1,100 pages of regulations behind the FAFSA. You know, tax returns have a multiple of that in the tax code. So that's a partial myth. Um, next myth is that your guidance counselor can help you. So guidance counselors in general are helpful, although all we really hear are complaints. But I think those complaints have to do more with unrealistic expectations from, uh, from parents. Um, but certainly, guidance counselors are not trained in financial aid, so I'm not here to um, you know to bash them. I, I do want to recognize that a lot of people are unhappy with the guidance counselors. But you know, there's good and bad guidance counselors. There's good and bad lawyers. Good and bad college consulting people. So it's not just guidance counselors. I really think it's more about the expectations. They're, you know, guidance counselors are busy. They have a lot of stuff to do that has nothing to do with college financial aid. And college financial aid is a real tough. Um, complicated uh, field and you know we've been in it a long time and written a book and uh, I still learn stuff you know almost daily um, all right myth number four for, forget about colleges with high sticker prices that is probably the biggest myth here that um, or, or the most widely uh, widespread myth here that, that Pearl and I hear a lot because people think that they sh they can't afford a private school so therefore 
um, they shouldn't bother applying. Well, most of the most of the time, the colleges with the highest sticker prices are going to offer you the biggest discounts. And I'll I'll go through some simple arithmetic with you later on that. Uh, and the last myth is that financial aid officers can help you get more money because colleges are quote unquote nonprofit institutions of higher education, which kind of implies that they're not really in it for themselves. They're really in it for nonprofit, you know, touchy feely, <laughs> um, we're on your side type reasons. And I'm guessing that most of you uh, are either rolling your eyes or you kind of understand that colleges are not necessarily, um, they don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. So that's why sometimes it's very hard to get help from a financial aid office. Um, sometimes you can't even get in touch with them. And most of the time, they're not going to give you the secrets on how to get more money because they are employees of an institution that actually wants your money. So it wouldn't be the best career move for them to show you how to get more. Now, there are exceptions. Don't get me wrong. Everything I'm saying here um, is an exception. I mean, there, there, are, there are exceptions to everything we're going to be going over here. But in general, you're not going to get help from a financial aid office because they have a different agenda than you do. Let's talk about college costs and these nonprofits, I, I should say. So why are they so expensive? Well, they pay salaries, huge salaries to university presidents, often uh, seven-figure salaries. And the biggest um, growth, the, the category that that's, um, colleges have expanded the most cost-wise is admin, secretaries, and people who are running, you know, marketing and the physical plant and all that's not, they're spending more money on professors. They're spending more money on admin because um, it takes a lot of infrastructure to be able to provide the amenities and all the other, you know, things that today's colleges provide, um, such as dorms, which, which I don't even know if they're called dorms anymore. I think they're really residences because you can't really call a suite where everyone has a private bathroom and they have a granite countertop kitchen with all the latest appliances, a dorm. You can't really call that a dorm. So those aren't cheap. Dining facilities, uh, there's no more mystery mean bug juice. It's five-star in many cases, you know, skirt steak, sushi, vegan, gluten-free, all the, all the fancy schmancy country club type of, uh, type of offerings. Recreational facilities, if you guys, anyone on this presentation, has um, has recently toured a college and seen you know where the kids work out. It's not some old YMCA with the basketball track over the, uh, the, the <laughs> a track over the basketball court. Yeah, you've got these 15, 20 million dollar multi-use aquatic facilities, rock climbing. A lot of schools have lazy rivers. Uh, and I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not talking about Disney. I'm talking about colleges. So those aren't cheap. Where do you think that money comes from to be able to afford that? And they're spending a ton of money on marketing. So they have expenses just like any business. And if you're wondering how yesterday's, and I know this is going to be offensive, but it's a free webinar, so Pearl will refund anyone who's, who's offended. Um, yesterday's dummy colleges are today's dream colleges. How did that happen? So when I say dummy colleges, I mean colleges that were not so hard to get into. If you are a parent and you say to yourself, and, and, and I have to tell you, Pearl and I even say this, and we've you know we've been in this business for year, years and years, but we still fall prey to this. We we have these thoughts like it wasn't like this when I was applying to college, and I, I you know I hear that from um, really uh, almost anyone who, uh, who who we come in contact with. And what you have to understand is that no, it's not supposed to be like it was. I mean, there's been a lot of other changes, like this thing called the internet, which just came out. Um, internet is that interweb, interwebs. Um, fax machines, cell phones, <laughs> there's been a few changes since we were going to, to college in the, in the Stone Age, but that's okay. I mean, you, either you adapt or you, you know, it's, Dar it's Darwinism. <laughs> you, have, you have to figure out what you, how you're going to handle that. Whether or not you're ready, sun's going to come up tomorrow. Um, yeah, co the college process is going to happen. Uh, how else? Well, all this marketing that they do, that you, a lot of colleges hire uh, CMOs, chief marketing officers, who are paid two to four hundred thousand dollars, and they are in charge of all these social media and email and direct mail, all sorts of you know types of campaigns that you would normally associate with, you know, um, buying a weight loss product or an acne product on an infomercial or a used car or you, you name it. You're getting the hard sell. Uh, where do colleges buy their data? That's a question that not everyone understands. Um, they get it from the College Board, who is also a nonprofit, by the way. 
College Board, we think about as SAT folks, but um, they're also in many other businesses, including data sales. If you want an in, uh, uh, just a little more background on this, if you do a, uh, you know, Google how Northeastern University gamed the rankings. Because Northeastern is one of these schools where, you know, I grew up right outside of Boston, and Northeastern was not where the best and the brightest kids went. I'm sorry. Now it's number 48 in the country, according to the last poll I saw in U.S. News and World Report. It's crazy. But you'll see how they pulled this off if you're curious. Um, you know, another thing I always say, which, which uh, offends some people, but it's still true, so I'm going to say it again, is that you know, the University of Miami, which now is a really hard school to get into, you need a 2,000 on your SAT, you need you know, to be in the top 10% of your class. Uh, back then, when we were all applying, you really only needed to meet three criteria. It wasn't that hard. You needed to have about a C average or a little bit better, had to have really rich parents, and you had to have a cocaine habit, and then you got in. So that, that's all you needed, those three things. Okay. Um, Pearl, how are we doing? Getting, getting some people chatting with you? A little chit-chat? Okay. So we'll, we'll stop for some questions um, if, if we need to. Um, all right, financial aid and scholarship facts. These are, you know, these are things that don't get talked about a lot. The average discount at a private college is 45%. It's almost half off, and that number has grown every year. Um, I'm looking forward to it this year when the National Association of Collegiate Business Officers um, you know, talk about this this type of um, what's go what's going on here, this type of fact, and I I'm guessing next year it'll be up to maybe 47 percent. It's growing it's it's growing every year. Uh, I mentioned this before. Most money goes to parents in the top quartile of income. <clears throat> Another fact: there are legal ways to double or triple your eligibility for financial aid, and we will talk about some specific strategies that you can employ. And it's similar to Medicaid planning. You know. In Medicaid plan, if you have a senior citizen who's trying to um, improve eligibility for health benefits for Medicaid, they go to a lawyer, they work up paperwork, they start transferring assets out of their name. So for financial aid, it works in a similar way. It's not identical, but but moving money around in, in a, a similar fashion can improve your eligibility for other benefits, for financial aid benefits from colleges. And the last fact is that colleges are businesses, and they will negotiate if it's in their best interests, and we'll talk about that. Let's discuss how to get need-based aid. I'm going to talk to you about the FAFSA, and Pearl is sitting here right in front of me. I'm not going to call on her, but she took a break from uh, cranking out FAFSAs just to help me out here. Uh, FAFSA has a little bit more than 100 questions. I think it might be 108 questions, and again, there's 1,100 pages of regulations behind it, but it's only about 100 questions. Every college requires it. It factors in 70 or so different items, including income, which is very important, but by no means the only one because, like I said, it's about 77 factors, including income, that get considered by the FAFSA. So your savings, meaning where you have money, the number of kids you have in college, your age, and a bunch of other things, but those are the main most important factors. There are exemptions in the FAFSA, meaning things you don't have to tell them about, which um, a lot of parents... Uh, over include they don't they, they talk about stuff that's exempt instead of refusing to disclose it so I'm gonna get to that and there's a bunch of landmines that can cost you money on you know money that you need or money that you should be entitled to assets some are not part of the financial aid picture as far as the FAFSA is concerned so what are those assets well retirement accounts do not count against you they should not be disclosed on the FAFSA now I saw a last minute question this morning about the CSS profile, which I'm going to get to, um, the CSS profile is different. But now we're just talking about the FAFSA, which every college requires. Not, not every college requires a CSS profile. So retirement accounts do not count against you. They are exempt assets. Never disclose those on a FAFSA. Same thing with your primary residence. That is not an asset. So when the FAFSA asks you about the value of your home, it, does not, it says very specifically not, your, not where you live, not your primary residence. Annuities are also exempt on the FAFSA. So sometimes, and I'm not telling you you should do this, this is the weasel language of a recovering attorney coming out. Sometimes people will, will go to workshops or seminars from financial planning people who will say something like, hey, you can improve your eligibility by um, taking your money out of your stock account or your mutual funds and throwing it into an annuity. And 
putting aside the misgivings about whether that's a suitable investment and all those types of compliance things, because again, I told you recovery attorney, I used to be head of compliance for a brokerage firm. Um, <clears throat> that may not work for you, but, but um, it is an exempt asset on the FAFSA, so it's something worth discussing. And then another exempt asset is whole life insurance, you know, insurance with cash value. Um, again, sometimes people will quote unquote shelter money in insurance products. You have to be wary of the same types of things, how the products work, where the fees, how you get your money back, that type of thing, but can be effective. And if you're a small business, a small business owner, um, I don't, I think I added an extra S in business there. If you're a small, the extra S is for savings. No, it doesn't work that way. So if you're a small business owner, there's a question on the FAFSA that, um, asks you to value your business. Um, most people on this presentation, if you're small business owners, have a business worth zero. And if you read the directions, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, more loopholes and landmines. These are actually uh, more on the landmine side. Student assets are penalized much more severely, 400 times more than parent assets. So in other words, again, when you fill out the FAFSA, they are calculating how much you should be able to afford. And I'm going to give you that formula in a little bit. So if you have money in the wrong places, like in your kid's name, it's gonna, you're going to be penalized 400 times more than if you had it in your own name. You're penalized 20% of the amount if it's in your student's name, your kid's name, but if it's in your name, you're penalized at a little bit more than 5%. So when, I talk, when I'm talking about student or, or kid accounts, child accounts, I'm referring to custodial accounts, to UTMA, to UGMA uh, accounts. I'm not talking here about 529s. I'm about to. So let me pause and just say, does everyone, does everyone, if you understand this, just you know, say, tell, tell Pearl in chat. And if you have a question, keep in mind, I'm about to get to more description. But if, if you understand this so far, just say yes. Pearl, let me know if there's any action in there. You getting some yeses? Okay. Um, she's smiling. I don't know what it means when you smile, other than you're just happy. Or you have gas. Okay. You don't have gas? Okay. Um, some resources here. If you want to take a look at how the how the um, f the the FAFSA uh, how the FAFSA works, go to the website fafsa.gov. That um, you can you can do uh, what's called a FAFSA forecast, or you can start you know calculating, or they will calculate for you you know what your FAFSA is going to look like. You don't actually have to file it and disclose anything. Um, and also, I think my um, of course shamelessly, I think my book is pretty good. How to pay wholesale for college which you can check out on, uh, on Amazon. Okay, in some libraries. Now let's talk about this 529. Is it a friend or a foe? So it's now counted, and this changed favorably, I believe it was 2008. It is now, uh, it is now counted as a parent asset. So you're, you're penalized at five-ish percent as opposed to 20% of the amount. Just so you understand what I'm talking about. If you had $100,000, and you were penalized at 20%. What that means is that the, the, the colleges and the financial aid formulas would take 20% of that and reduce your eligibility. So in other words, you'd, you'd reduce your eligibility by $20,000. But because it's now a parent asset, then you're reducing your eligibility by only $5,640. So it's better now. It used to be considered a child asset, which is worse. However, a lot of us are, are question, a lot of people in my field question whether private colleges still treat the 529 is a child asset and penalize it at 20% or, or 400% more than the federal rules. And th that's kind of up for discussion, but um, in, my, in, our, in our collective experience, not just my own experience, um, a, lot of us, a lot of us college planners across the country think that private colleges that have their own money still look at the 529 the old way, which is penalizing kids' um, money much more severely. So should you sell your 529? I get that question a lot. My recovering attorney answer, I can't give you an answer. <laughs> but I'll tell you what you how you should work through this question. Number one, figure out what the potential benefit is. I just kind of worked through the math with you in terms of if you're applying to a private school that may treat the 529 as a child asset, then you look at saving $20,000 of eligibility, but you also have to offset that with the potential negatives, meaning what are the costs? What are the tax hits if you're paying a penalty for moving it for terminating the 529 early which you do it's based on earnings 10% of earnings is what you pay as a penalty 
So it may not pay to move stuff around. Many people on this presentation um, would not benefit by sheltering their assets. And there's because there's a lot of moving parts involved with uh, beyond just saying, is the 529 good or bad? So you have to look at what your income is. You know, Because if you're not going to qualify, if you're a high income earner, if you earn a million dollars, a 529 is a great product for you because it's one of the few tax benefits that you can get. President Obama tried to um, pull that away a few weeks ago as I'm recording this. But I guess he came to his senses when, you know, everyone, Democrat and Republican, pretty much, you know, lambasted and saying you can't take this tax break away from the middle class. So um, for now, it's it's still a great, um, still a great investment. But you've got to look at not only you know whether you're going to qualify based on your income and other factors, but what types of colleges are you applying to? If you're applying to mostly private colleges that may treat the 529 as a child asset, then you should consider moving it. But if you're applying only to state schools or schools that that you know, treat the, the 529 as a parent asset, maybe you shouldn't move it. Um, and, you know, there's other factors too. I mentioned this before, like the number of uh, kids you have in college enrolled at the same time. So I mentioned the CSS profile before. The CSS profile is a different financial aid form, and it's a product that is made by the College Board, the people, the Good Samaritans behind the SAT. So it's tricky. And technically, well, uh, I'm doing a spoiler alert here. Uh, let me back up. It's about 200 or so questions. So it's, so it's about twice as long as the FAFSA. So it's required by approximately 260 mostly private colleges. The way you find out whether your college takes it or not is by looking on the college's website. There's no shortcut. You could go on the College Board site because they make the profile. Pearl and, uh, and I occasionally have seen mistakes. So I'll go to each college's website to make sure that the college does, in fact, take the CSS profile. Um, it's got a jibe with the FAFSA. It's got to be consistent with the FAFSA. Otherwise, it's a red flag. So be, um, be very careful, okay? Um, and I started to say this before. It's a College Board product. That means that the student is technically supposed to be able to, um, is supposed to, be able to, to complete this form easily, which is kind of a nuts. So oh, I'm just going to pause here. We're getting some questions. I guess the chat isn't working on our end for some reason, probably because we have no idea how to run this stuff. But um, please email Pearl your questions. We're starting to get some emails. Her email address is pearl at andylockwood.com. Um, I'm getting a question on admissions. I'm not going to answer. I'm actually going to. I'm going to answer that privately because this is a, a, a financial aid presentation. But it, it is a good question and. Um, that's from uh, Robert McLaughlin. So, so um, I will get back to you personally. Pearl has your email address. I want you to feel like you're being blown off here. Let's talk about some landmines um, that can mess you up. So I talked about one of these already, disclosing exempt assets, meaning assets that do not count against you. I'm, that that <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you don't have to talk about your retirement accounts. People make that mistake. You know, We had a very sophisticated client um, before he retained us cost himself about eleven thousand dollars at Ithaca because he he mentioned his five hundred something thousand dollar um, IRA which did not need to go in there. Um, <clears throat> mixing up your parent and your and your student stuff, meaning income and assets, it's very easy to screw that up on the FAFSA because you jump around from um, from section to section. So you already saw the implications of doing that because parent assets are treated much more benignly. They're not penalized nearly as much as ch uh, as child assets and income of course is also different you want you would not want to misattribute if that's a word child income um, I mean income to the child when it's really your income because you'll also shoot yourself in the foot there another big mistake or landmine is not knowing your deadlines and blowing your priority deadlines um, especially this time of year there's a lot of people you know I'm recording this at the end of February there's a lot of people who have March 1st deadlines who are who are seniors class of 2015 and um, they're finding out that they have financial aid forms due and and the reason that sometimes it's it's hard to uh, you know hard to get this information is because it's buried on, on most colleges websites and the FAFSA itself says you can file it up to June which you can you can file it up to June 30th but you'll, you'll miss out on a lot of the money that the schools have already given out. So um, if you miss a priority deadline, it's bad. Is it fatal? Not always. But the point is, is that you want to do whatever you can to, uh, to not miss it. Even if you haven't done your tax returns, by the way, 
lot of people think that they shouldn't do the FAFSA until their tax returns are done. It's actually not true. You should file your FAFSA and your CSS profile with estimates, and then you can ultimately you'll send your tax returns to that school. Another big landmine, sort of silly but but easily understandable clerical mistakes. You're mixing up social security numbers, dates of birth. Um, happens every year with Pearl where she enters a student's social security number from the tax return, puts it on the FAFSA, gets submitted, and then three weeks later we find out that the social security number is wrong and the client calls up Pearl and is like, hey, what happened? And she said, well, I got your social security number off your tax return. And then you know what happens? The client says, oh, that's the wrong social security number. So these things, they sound silly. There's, there's, we could probably do a whole hour on, uh, on silly mistakes like that. You've got to just be very, very careful. Don't, don't trust, don't even trust your accountant to get the right information on your, <laughs> on your, uh, on your tax return. Um, a lot of people start and stop and never finish a FAFSA. They think they've applied, but they haven't. That's uh, there's a shockingly high number of people who do that. Bless you, Pearl. Okay, sneezing on the truth. And the last mistake is not applying. Let, uh, the biggest stat I saw that I really have no idea how they verify this, but supposedly 53% of eligible people don't even apply for financial aid. Um, I want to give you this resource. It's a new product that uh, we came up with, which is a, a training a series of training videos that walk you through the FAFSA and the CSS profile. A lot of times we, when I do these presentations and we ask, you know, what should we have covered? What do you wish we covered? That we did get a chance to. People say examples of the FAFSA. So I put together, um, it's a, it's a web-based training. There's something like 29 lessons, including how to do all the forms, how to negotiate, how to research stuff, how to move money around. And that is, um, that's a cool product if I do say so. And that's on um, instantcollegefunding.com. All right, need-based aid. <clears throat> Still, FAFSA and the CSS profile use the same formula, but they apply it differently. So what do I mean by apply it differently? Well, for example, in the, under the FAFSA, the, your, the value of your house doesn't count as an asset. It's not a resource that can be used to pay for college, but on the profile, it is. On the FAFSA, you're not supposed to disclose your retirement accounts. But on the profile, you do disclose them. Now, the question is, and this was the last-minute question I got this morning, um, the question is, does that count against you? And the answer is, I really don't think so. But part of me is so cynical and suspicious that I wonder, well, if they really didn't count it against you, why would they bother asking you for those amounts? So most colleges on the record will say, no, we don't count your, your retirement accounts as an asset or as a resource that can be used to pay for college. But um, I'm a little suspicious. But I, I, overall, without, at the risk of sounding naive, I, I think that, that even though it's disclosed on the profile, again, that's 260 colleges, um, that does not mean that it's going to penalize you. So here's the formula. The formula is COA minus EFC equals need, cost of attendance, minus your estimated family contribution equals need. That's the magic formula. COA minus EFC equals need. <clears throat> and I'm going to explore that. Um, oh, look, I, I mentioned most of this stuff before. The FAFSA versus profile, the profile counts twice as long, uh, is, is twice as long and 10 times as invasive, and your kid's supposed to fill it out. Uh, I mentioned the retirement stuff. I mentioned the, value of the primary residence. Oh, the last thing, I'm glad I wrote this down. What a great presentation. The last thing is that the CSS profile does not exempt annuities. So, so the annuities are exempt on the FAFSA as assets that don't count against you. But um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because a lot of times, again, financial people will say, hey, you should buy an annuity because that will uh, shelter, meaning improve your eligibility. It will shelter your assets. The problem is that if the client is applying to a bunch of CSS profile colleges, then it's not going to work. The only person it will benefit is the financial guy who's getting a commission. All right. So here's the formula that they both use. <clears throat> and I'm going to put it, uh, say, it in, in action, display it in action right here. So let's say that the cost of attendance of a college is sadly uh, rounded down to $60,000 per year. It's a private college. And let's say that your 
you make about $130,000 or so, that means your EFC should be somewhere around $30,000. That means you're showing $30,000 worth of need. Cost of attendance minus EFC equals need. So the next question is, well, what does that mean? Do you receive all $30,000? Do you receive your entire need in aid? Because you always pay your estimated family contribution. But then the question is, well, what about the, the amount that's left over? The answer is that you will receive a percentage of need. So in this example, you'll receive a percentage of that $30,000 of need. You'll pay your EFC, which is 30, then whatever amount is left over, you pay in addition for a school that costs $60,000. So approximately 60 colleges will meet 100% of your need. So at those colleges, that they make, let's say in this example, let's say it costs $60,000 and your EFC is 30, if you're at one of those 60 colleges, you don't pay a dollar more. You're just going to pay $30,000 for a $60,000 per year school. If you guys are with me on that, if you have questions on that, pause, or I will pause here, but just email them to Pearl. Again, sorry about the chat not working. Pearl at AndyLockwood.com. Pearl, are you checking your emails? You're not playing words with friends. You're checking your emails? A little bit of both? Checking. Okay. It's so funny how mute you are like when I'm doing these things, but like in real life, I mean, what's up with that? Can we talk? Pearl and I are flying out to San Diego uh, in a couple of hours, so we're going to have a lot of time to, for her to um, complain about how obnoxious I was. So I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to get in my shots now. So, um, okay, so, so that's 60 colleges. That mean 100% of need. Most private colleges will meet a pretty high percentage of financial need, between 75 to 90%, I would say. It's a pretty wide range. So again, they'll cover that part of that $30,000 worth of need that you see in this example. And public schools are stingy. A lot of them meet like 50%. They just don't have the money. That's really the issue. Their budgets are being cut from the state legislatures, but their costs are going up. And they, you know, they've been raising their prices actually faster than private schools have. Um, and so they just don't have that much to, to give. They rely on federal funds. And they don't have that much of their own. So what do you pay out of pocket? Just this is a little bit of a of exploration here. Um, <clears throat> if a college meets 90% of need, meaning $27,000, if your need is $30,000, they're going to meet $27,000. You pay your unmet need, which is the 10%, because they're covering 90. So you're going to pay your $3,000 unmet need plus your EFC of $30,000. Your total is $33,000. Any questions on that? It's simple arithmetic, but not everyone gets it the first time. I just want you to make sure that you're with me on that. It's the, your EFC is, it was what you always pay, and then your unmet need. Pearl, any questions or comments? One question? What's the question? Just tell me. Which EFC determined? How is EFC determined? That is a great question. So <clears throat> the answer is that it's based on those factors that I mentioned before. Your income, your assets, your age, the number of kids in college at the same time, and um, a bunch of other things. But once you complete the FAFSA and submit it, you'll automatically receive your EFC. It'll be spat out at you. And it'll say something like, your EFC, by the way, it'll never be $30,000. It'll be, your EFC is 30796. You know, it's never a round number, probably because it's formulaic. So that's how you um, calculate your EFC. And in terms of how to lower your EFC, you would look at, which, should, which is probably the next question, um, you should look at those types of exempt assets. And like, like I was saying before, sometimes it makes sense to move your money out of a bucket, quote-unquote bucket, that counts against you and into a bucket that doesn't count against you at all, like insurance annuities, retirement accounts, paying off your mortgage, things like that. So that's how you do it, but I can't advise you on whether that makes sense for you. Here's a comparison of private colleges versus state universities, expensive versus cheap. If, I, if you could see me, I'd be doing air quotes right now, but I'll spare you that. So on the left column, you, you see the example that um, we were using. On the right column, the public university, the cost of attendance is a little bit lower. EFC is the same because it should be basically the same. And the need is just simple arithmetic. You're showing $15,000 worth of need. 
So in this example, the private college, again, meets 90% of need. So you are paying, oh, I made a mistake there. Instead of 30000 it should say $33,000 out of pocket. Damn, I hate when I do that. Um, but the public university, check this out, they only meet 50% of need. So the need there is $15,000. So 50% 50 of that is $7,500. So you're covering the other $7,500, the other 50%, and your EFC. So you'll pay $37,500 out of pocket at that school. So I just want, if, even if you don't understand this arithmetic, what I want to point out to you is that frequently, the private college, even though the sticker price is $15,000 per year more than the public university, will actually end up being less out of pocket to you because they discount more. Private colleges meet a greater percentage of need. That's what you should take away from this slide. Okay, there's a little delay, so I can't tell people have questions on this. Ooh, that's a good question. Are merit and need awards mutually exclusive or... Are they or are they combined? I'm going to hold off on answering that just in case I have a slide on that. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> Got some respiratory issues. Okay. Um, so that was an apples to apples comparison. You know, we're just comparing one year and one year. But now, let me throw in a few more factors to the mix here. So private colleges, they do a better job at graduating kids in four years, usually in the 80 percentile range. Public universities. Are, are bad. You know, in, in, um, in New York, um, we've got the flagship state university, Binghamton, which 63% get out in four years. 6-3. Every other school is below 50%, and some are like 15. It's, it's ridiculous. So what I'm saying is that it's a lot harder to get out of a public university in four years than it is a private college. So if you factor in the extra year, year and a half, two years that you're likely to spend at a public university, if you look at the odds, then the comparison, apples to oranges, becomes more compelling. Why is it so hard to get out in four years? It's really, the main culprit is really because of the classes. You know, the, the, you get frozen out of your classes. If you know anyone, or if you are someone who's put a kid through a state school, frequently the feedback you get is that they had to wait a year or two before they got the class they needed to satisfy their major, such as, you know, uh, accounting 101 if you're a business major that type of thing that just doesn't happen at private colleges Pearl any questions or are you just looking at restaurants in San Diego not yet okay that's where we're going by the way everybody thank you all you suckers in New York enjoy the cold weather we'll be, <laughs> we'll be in San Diego in a conference room um, all right so does this work for everybody am I promising that you can get a private school education for less than a state university sticker price the answer is no, I'm not promising that, but I am saying that this will work for many, but not for everybody. My point is that you should not rule out private colleges. Don't rule them out on sticker price alone. Just wanted to have a little adult moment there. Okay, so how is financial need met? So we already talked about school giving an award of, you know, let's call it $27,000, but what does that look like? And that varies also by college. So, so they may give you mostly free money, which are grants and scholarships, and sometimes they blur the line between um, need-based, which is typically what, the, what grants refer to, and merit-based, which is typically what scholarships refer to. Although I was looking at an award for um, a client in uh, Canada, actually, and she received a scholarship from Harvard, even though technically they are strictly need-based. Didn't understand that one. And, um, and then there's loans which many schools, you know, award. And then there's two types of loans, there's subsidized and unsubsidized. And then, which I'm going to explore a little bit. And then there is work study, which means you get a job and they deduct the amount they would have paid you like an indentured servant from the tuition bill. Pearl, you're waving, uh, you're texting me. Okay, so I'm gonna stop for a question. Where's your question? I should have had you on the mic over here. So a Pearl is, uh, who, who asked that? Linda Morrissey. Linda Thank you, Linda. She's asking, and I'm just going to, hopefully I'm not butchering your question, is there a magic income number where you make too much to qualify for financial aid? And the answer is that you, 
Is that right? To even submit the FAFSA. No, anyone, anyone can submit the FAFSA. I'm not, I'm not sure that's what she's asking. But she was told she was told not she was told not to file the FAFSA by um, her guidance counselor. Financial planner. Okay. Okay, this is crazy. I'm giving you your own mic. You know what? You do the presentation next time. This will be better. I'd rather I'd rather listen to you than talk. So the um, there is no magic number. If you were to scour the internet and every college's website for a magic number where you should not file a FAFSA, then you would uh, never find it because it doesn't exist. Because, like I said before, there are 70 odd factors, um, including income. Income is the most important, but by no means the only factor. So I can give you some rules of thumb. If you have one kid in college, well, let's say, okay, let's say that you make $200,000 and you have one kid in college and you're applying to only state schools. Forget it, you won't get anything from FAFSA. So, by the way, that doesn't mean that the school is not gonna require you to fill a FAFSA out. You, you, many schools want you to submit it anyway. But if you make $200,000 and you're applying to a private college with only one kid in the school, it is not impossible, it's just hard. So for private colleges, the closer you get to $200,000 in income, the, uh, the harder it is to qualify. But check this out. Let's say you've, like many families, you've got more than one kid. And let's say child number two enters college in two years. They're two, they're, they're two grades apart. That family that got discouraged by filling out a FAFSA because they make you know in the $200,000 range and didn't qualify, if they don't file in the year where they have overlapping college students, they're screwing themselves because that is a big game changer. It splits the expected family contribution in half. So if you are a family that makes, you know, let's call it $250,000 and your EFC is $60,000, you're not going to get anything. But once you add your second child, your EFC is now $30,000. It's half of the 60. And um, I always like to point out that we have clients with quintuplets. Um, they really do well. From, from from most of the schools, not every school, because it, uh, schools vary by how generous they are. So there's no magic number. That was my long-winded answer. That's that's a very good question. Um, I should have probably put that in the slides. So thanks, thanks for your help. Um, by the way, let me just get back to this. <clears throat> a lot of people have opinions and urban legends and half-baked, you know, facts type things about this process, but they don't really understand it. And they haven't taken time to read the regulations. They haven't, you know, uh, done the research required to write a book, which I will never do again. <laughs> again. Um, so I think what you need to do is to understand that um, you should listen to people who have this expertise. And I'm. This is not a plug for us. I, and there are other people, you know, who who know at least as much about the financial aid formulas as we do. Uh, my point is is that um, you shouldn't listen to someone who doesn't know. And that's typically financial planners, CPAs, guidance counselors, and other people that you would think should know, but they don't because they don't they don't know the stuff. You have another question, Pro? Yes, sir. Two questions about this stuff? Yes. Oh, okay. If you receive financial aid from one school, will others that you have applied to do the same? I know each school is different in merit based reward. Okay, so the question and who's that from? Don Easley. Don Easley. Okay. Hey Don. Yeah, Don. Donna. Oh Donna. Oh Donna, that's right, I forgot. It's Don and Donna. Um <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to give Don credit for that. That's a that's a really smart question. I'd rather give Don a credit for that question. So, um, sorry. So the question was, um, will you get the same award from each school? No, the schools apply the financial aid formulas differently. Some schools are more generous than others, and I'm going to actually explore that later. What's the next question, Pearl? Lightning round. Can you be given more than one award package? Can you be given more than one award package from from ones from Chris who? Chris Vasquez. Chris Vasquez. Okay. Um, you can be given one award package per college, but colleges occasionally will revise their award packages after you appeal, which is also coming up shortly when we come back from break from a word from our sponsor, except we don't have any sponsors. So I'm just going to keep going on with the, <laughs> with the 50 minute work, uh, 50 minute mark. All right. How do you, uh, this, these are the five steps to, to do the, to, to, to come up with your college financial plan. First thing you need to do is to calculate your EFC. You can, I told you, you can, uh, you should do that before. And in response to another question, if you Google FAFSA forecaster, it's on the FAFSA website, you will get your EFC. It won't tell you by the way, how to reduce your EFC by using some of the strategies we talked about by moving money around, but it, but it, it will give you an idea of your EFC. 
um, you should identify at that point whether it makes sense to pursue need-based planning, meaning ways to lower your EFC, or merit-based strategies, or some sort of combination. That's the second thing. It's, it's, it's a decision that you make. The next thing is, <clears throat> number three, is identify best-fit colleges that are likely to fund and to get your kids out in four years. And when I say likely to fund, that means either need-based or merit-based, whichever path you are pursuing. Number four is one of these easier said than done things. And Pearl, I'm looking for your facial expression here. Set realistic expectations and get the entire family on the same page. Nodding in deep approbation. I think that's a word. Um, a lot of times the tension and the stress revolves around, and I'm not doing this only to overgeneralize, but it tends to be dad wants the kid to go to the cheap school. Mom and the kid think the child should have a great quote-unquote college experience at the expensive school. So I can't even get into that here, but that's, <laughs> that's I, I know that's a common experience. I'm guessing many of you on this presentation have had that experience or are going to have that experience. But it's really important to start talking about this stuff before you get serious, and I'm talking about sophomore, junior year, before you start visiting colleges and, and, and deciding that, oh, I love Duke because it's $65,000 a year, and they have a great basketball team and a great reputation. Um, and then the fifth part of the plan here is knowing which forms are required and when. When are they required? Are you applying to FAFSA-only schools or CSS profile schools? Another question coming from Pearl. Say it loud. What period? Your income from the calendar. Ooh, what period do they determine your income from? Who's that question from? Robert McLaughlin. Robert McLaughlin. On fire today. Bobby Mack. No, I don't need, by the way, I don't, I've never met you. So I, someone must have called you that growing up, though. Um, I grew up in Boston. I, I definitely knew a lot of Bobby Macks. So I have a cousin who's a Mack. Uh, a Duncan. Duncan Mack. <laughs> so, but maybe I'll answer the, the question. Um, I don't want to miss our flight. So the the what the what the colleges look at is your base year. So if you have a rising senior, meaning someone who graduates in 2016, the tax year that ends in the middle of your senior year, 2015, is the year that they look at. They don't look at five years back. They don't look at you know two years back. They look at your base year, which is the year that ends in the middle of senior year. Now to be fair. On the profile, right, Pearl, they ask about, you know, tell me about the year before, tell me about what you anticipate for the next year. By the way, one more time, this is for your kid to fill out technically. Please don't let your kid do that as a tip. But it's really a one-year uh, look back, so to speak, and so sort of in the middle of the senior year, so it's not even a full year. Now, um, there, there are situations where, for example, um, <clears throat> we had a client this year who really had a hard time job-wise, and his income for 2014 looks pretty decent. However, he was in and out of work um, at the end of the year, so and now he's still looking. So even though his income on paper may appear to be you know decent by many standards, he's not currently earning that. So he's kind of um, he's got some issues in the financial aid formulas, but. Like I said, there are ways to alert the financial aid office about other things when you appeal. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to get into that. So I, I mentioned this before, financial need is in the eye of the beholder. It's based on these formulas. However, uh, or but, financial aid offices have what they call professional discretion. They can make adjustments based on other facts that have come to light or other facts that weigh in this uh, decision that you may or may not be aware of. And colleges, uh, you know, it's very hard to find this information, but colleges, there's a term for what they do. They engage in something called preferential packaging, which kind of means that if you have two families and let's say you're going to an Ivy League school and you play the cross. Um, I was having, uh, I don't know if he's on this presentation, but I was having breakfast with a friend of mine who played the cross at Brown. And um, if you had two families at Brown, which is an Ivy League college and is a need-based, strictly need-based school, uh, like every Ivy League school, meaning they don't give out any awards other than your, based on your financial need. And if you are an athlete 
um, you don't get any athletic scholarship money because, again, they don't have that. But if there are two families, identical income, assets, and in every which way under the financial aid formulas, they're identical. But one of them plays lacrosse and is recruited or whatever sport it is, and another one, the other family does not, I promise you that somehow the athlete's going to show more need. So that is why I am saying here that the line between need and merit is frequently blurred because there's no other explanation. Uh, and colleges, if you ask them to, they can possibly reassess your need. Uh, and I, I do a class on that, um, which you can check out. The website's on this page, but let me just make a few more comments. Um, <clears throat> one of the people actually who's on this, on this presentation who requested anonymity um, had a uh, kind of a crazy experience last year where her son got into two rival Ivy League colleges, and I won't mention their names, but um, one of them rhymes with Harvard, and the, <laughs> the other one rhymes with Yale. Uh, Pale, sorry, rhymes with both of those. You are quick, Pearl. So um, both schools are financial need only colleges. And that means that they do not consider any, technically, ostensibly, do not consider anything other than income assets and so forth. Well, long story short, kid got a great award from one school and, a z and zero from the other school. So we showed the other school, the zero school, what the first school had offered. And we sent the, um, the copy of that not only to financial aid, but also to admissions. And lo and behold, the college reassessed the award. And instead of offering zero, went up to an amount close to forty thousand dollars so <laughs> i'm not saying this because i want i want you to know that this happens all the time um things like this happen a couple times a year for us maybe three or four times a year so far this year uh, early uh, we had a client get into another um, ivy league school and they uh, had submitted the forms and they showed no need whatsoever and they got zero but once we were able to appeal, which um, we're going to talk about now, we were, oh, in, a, in a few slides, I should say, um, we were able to increase that award from zero to, um, I think it's going to be close to $19,000. It's going to be at least $16,200, but um, it looks like it's going to be a little bit more than that. Okay, Pearl's holding up her finger. You have one more question for me? Yes? Did you hear directly from colleges with financial awards after they received the FAFSA, or did you also get a letter from FAFSA directly? Hmm. Okay, you answer that? Okay, so let me say the question first. Okay, so the question was, do you find out what your award is from the school, or do you get some sort of notification from FAFSA, what your EFC is? And the answer is really both. FAFSA, you file the FAFSA, instantly you get your EFC. And the school will take the information from the FAFSA and the profile if they are a profile school, and they will issue your financial aid award sometime in March or April. Exactly. And then by May 1st, you said the same thing? I love you. Um, that was to Pearl, not any of you on this presentation, although I am a very loving person. But uh, yeah, that's, um, and then you have to make your decision by May 1st. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I'm going a little bit out of order, but um, I just had to squeeze in all this stuff because we're already at the hour mark and I want to wrap up here. <clears throat> so. I want to make some notes on loans. Get it? Because you can do a promissory note. All right, it's a law lawyer joke. Um, there's different types of loans, and I just want to run through them pretty quickly because I never talk about this in my presentations anymore, mostly because of my own sort of flashbacks about student loans, I guess. So um, first of all, um, when you fill out a FAFSA, you will get one of two loans. If you're qualifying for a need-based loan, and again, this is part of the package. It may not be the entirety of it, but it's part of the package. If you're qualifying for a need-based loan, you're going to get the subsidized Stafford loan, or it's now called the subsidized direct loan. Every school does not use the same nomenclature, by the way. It's still very confusing. I think it's purposeful, but enough about my own uh, conspiracy theories. Um, the subsidized loan means that you can not pay the interest, I meaning the government subsidizes the interest for the entirety of your college career and then six months thereafter. So, uh, and if you go to law, if you go to grad school, like law and medical or, or, or business school, then you, you also have its, uh, the subsidy still in effect. You don't have to pay the interest. And the other type of loan, which is given out just from filling out a FAFSA, is the unsubsidized loan. And in that case, the interest accrues right away. They have different payment plans, but that interest accrues right away. The loan amounts for each of these is pretty small. 
fifty five hundred for year one, and then they, they, they go up each year. The interest rates are reset each year. I think the subsidized rate is in the high threes, and the um, non subsidized rate is I think in the sixes. Um, that's embarrassing because I don't know that, but it might might I think the subsidized might even be a little bit higher. Either way, they're low interest loans, but the uh, the non subsidized loan is a higher rate. Okay, so those are student loans. There are parent loans that that the school sometimes says, "Hey, congratulations, we're giving you this loan." In fact, they don't give you the loan. It comes from the Department of Education. It's called a Plus loan, parent loan for undergraduate students. Plus, so it's not really an award. It's just here you automatically get this, and it is based on your credit. But unless you've had some sort of bankruptcy or foreclosure or or near foreclosure. Um, you're going to qualify. Barring those two things, it's a lot easier to um, to, to qualify. So uh, if you have outstanding student loans that you're in default on or something, then you won't qualify for a parent loan. But other than that, it's pretty easy. Um, that interest rate resets every year. It's in the low sevens now. And um, you are allowed to borrow up to the full amount of the cost of attendance. So it's a stopgap sort of um, measure that is, I guess, an entitlement that um, the Department of Education makes available to to parents who qualify. And again, most parents will will qualify. So um, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. You you know, once the dust settles in March and April, if you know your financial aid award, if you still need money left over, that's when you apply for the plus loan. And the last source of funding of, of borrowing that I want to talk about are private student loans. And I want to make some comments about co-signing. So. There are um, still a decent amount, 20-odd um, private loan lenders, I guess, and programs out there. Discover Bank does them. Sally Mae does them. Um, there's a whole lot. I should have put this on the slide. Um, there's a site called simpletuition.com, simpletuition, S-I-M-P-L-E-T-U-I-T-I-O-N, that um, will kind of shop around loans for you that I've used on behalf of my clients before. Um, by the way, any questions on this? Chat's not working. I should have said this before. Chat is not working, So, um, but Pearl is working and chatting. So you can email her, pearl at andylockwood.com, especially if you have questions about this stuff. So the PLUS loan is, um, I'm sorry, talked about the PLUS loan. The private student loans usually require the parent to co-sign. They're in the student's name, but usually students don't have a credit history or they're not old enough, so they require a co-signer. But Here's a big tip. If you make a certain amount of payments on time for most, and this varies, of course, by the terms of the loan. Sometimes it's 24 of, of uh, 24 consecutive months of timely payments. Sometimes it's 36. If you do that, then the, um, the, the, the bank may release you from your co-signing obligation. So <clears throat> look for that. And if it's not there, then find another loan because you don't want to be a co-signer forever on this. Pearl, any questions on this? None, but we are on delay, so I, I usually get questions on that when I think about <sighs> think about talking about it. All right, let's talk about some financial aid award letters. Some colleges use different terms from each other. So I, I mentioned before, the direct loan and the Stafford loan are really the same thing. A grant is free. A scholarship is free. Everything else is not free, <laughs> no matter what it's called. Uh, I, I mentioned before, some colleges award parent loans. They're just issuing you something, an entitlement from the Department of Education. And be careful. Don't just accept your award if it's not adequate because there's usually some room for negotiation. So how do you improve a crappy award? Number one, got to have the right mindset. It's okay to negotiate because most colleges will. Not always, but they will. Number two, understand that colleges do not always give their highest and best offer initially. Why? Because they're businesses. They're not on your side. I don't care what they say on their websites about making, you know, about the millions and gazillions of dollars they gave out last year and making college affordable for everybody. They may not give you every, every dollar that you are entitled to because they have, um, you know, their own agenda. So what are some circumstances that colleges will consider what uh, consider a, your appeal, meaning what can you tell them that they don't already know that might have some bearing on um, on your financial aid award? Well, 
But some of these have to do with stuff that they would never know about. So if you have unusually high expenses, some colleges will ask you about those, or will, will consider those, because they are not part of the financial aid forms. So in other words, getting back to how the forms work, it's based on income assets and 70 odd factors, none of which is has to do with your expenses or your cost of living or anything like that. So the financial aid forms are actually skewed to favor people who live in low expense areas of the country as opposed to people in idiots who live in New York and <laughs> Nassau County and Suffolk County, which I apparently are the two highest tax um, areas of the whole country. But any, you know, any Northeast uh, you know, city area or I guess West Coast, you know, Bay Area, um, you can earn $180,000 there and you will have the same estimated family contribution as someone who lives in the interior of the country, like in Wisconsin. So um, getting back to appealing, if you have high expenses that are due to, let's say, a divorce, or to a um, an illness, unreimbursed medical expenses, a family member that you have to support all of a sudden, those types of things, those are the types of expenses that a college will consider. And they should be significant. They shouldn't just be, well, you know, I give my mom, you know, 200 bucks for groceries every month, something like that. They have to be significant. So that might be something to tell them about. Um, another factor is what if you have unanticipated loss of income? Let's say you're self-employed and your business you know, goes in the dumper you know, because of the, uh, the economy or you got laid off or you, know, you got down, partially downsized, that type of thing. Um, that is also something that a financial aid office will consider. Now, my favorite one, and I mentioned this before when I was talking about the two colleges that rhymed with Harvard and <laughs> – all right, never, I'm not going to say the same joke – um, is is a competing offer from a rival college. And a rival college does not just have to be in the same conference. It can be two schools that want the same type of kid. So um, one of the examples that I, uh, I talk about, and I actually give real examples if, if you go to the, if, if you're in, interested in this training, um, appealsclass.com, you'll see some real live examples. And I, there, is, there is one example of a, of a kid who, got um, a whole, uh, an increase of about $30,000 from University of Southern California because we played off Syracuse University against USC. The kid was a communications um, major, and she, you know, we, she also got into um, Newhouse at Syracuse, and, um, but USC was her first choice school, so we went back and forth, and um, we were able to use that, that offer to get more out of USC. But I, I described the whole thing in that class if you're interested. But that's, you know, that, that's how you can improve a, a crappy award. And some other tips I want to tell you is you want to go about this being nice. You don't want to be aggressive and, and uh, entitled. You don't want to be annoying and obnoxious, which I know is the kettle calling the pot black here. Um, you need to explain to the financial aid office that the school to, you know, that, that, that particular college is the first choice school, number one choice school, not just, you know, give me some more money. And we're committed to coming if you can make it work for us. Some colleges will say, give us the number. Tell me what you can afford. Um, I always include not just financially, but also admissions. And if you're a student athlete, I include the coach and anyone else that you might have a relationship with. Um, but like I said, if you want more examples, like specific letters and some training on it, appealsclass.com. All right, let's talk about the truth about merit scholarships. Any, any questions, bro? No. Okay. Like, when is this ending? Are you getting that question? No. Um, the truth about merit scholarships. So the big question about merit scholarships is where are you applying? What pond are you fishing in? And um, a lot of times, you know, kids are only focused on schools that rank highly in business. If they rank highly in this or that. Or they don't want to go, they don't want to consider a school that's not highly ranked because they say, and I quote, but I work so hard, I don't want to go to school with a bunch of dumbasses. Or maybe they don't say something that cruel at least to me, but I know behind my back they're saying stuff like that. So, <clears throat> look, my answer is you should consider lesser schools, quote-unquote lesser schools, for a bunch of reasons. Number one, you're more likely to get funded from a school that is happy to have you. Number two, more often than not, that school uh, could be, possibly, and if, you, if you're being strategic about this, could be a better fit, uh, could be better for you academically. One of my favorite studies that's been updated a few times it was uh, done in 99 by a Princeton economist, and it tracked 
two two sets of kids. They each got into an elite college, like an Ivy or Ivy caliber college, but half of them got into uh, also got into and ended up matriculating at a state school or uh, just a regular college. And when the Princeton guys looked at their average earnings ten years out and and so forth, um, like I said, they updated this I think twice since then. They saw no difference, meaning that it matters more that you go to college than where you go to college, and it's really more about what you put into it and and what you get out of it after you make the effort. So that's just food for thought here. I, I know. Um, put this in the category of we're not right for everybody because I know a lot of this advice falls on deaf ears, but I, I feel like I had to say it to be responsible. And then there's a whole argument about being a big fish in a small pond um, versus vice versa. Because if you are planning about going to uh, plan, planning on going to grad school, where so much of the academic admit, admissions decision is based on your grades, uh, you know, your academic record. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to stand out at a quote-unquote lesser school. And um, many times, if you look at the admissions rates, and I'm, I don't care what you talk, you know, if you're talking about medical school, business school, law school, whatever, um, sometimes they are higher from the overlooked gem colleges as opposed to the elite schools where you struggle to get into. And, you know, if, like if you're trying to, if you have a choice between going to Binghamton versus MIT, and MIT is a great school, but it costs, you know, let's, let's be honest, it costs about $30,000 per year more than Binghamton. Uh, yeah, I'd have a very hard time justifying that, particularly if you're thinking about going to grad school, because at MIT, if you, if you don't have a 2300 on your SAT, it's like you have a learning disability. So at Binghamton, you might be better off going there and standing out and, you know, get, getting, uh, if, you, if you look at the grad schools where they pull kids from undergrad, if you look at the undergraduate colleges represented in most top grad schools, you'll see a big range, a huge mix of schools. Maybe a third of them will be the elite schools, I'm guessing, and all the rest will be just regular colleges and maybe even a bunch of schools you never heard of. So check that out. And if grad school is in the cards, you're talking about a lot of money. So why not save the money on uh, undergrad because it matters where you finish, not where you start. All right. So let's review here as we wrap up here. <clears throat> um, just not, not in the spirit of being a dead horse, but I think you need to hear this again. The less you spend on college, the more you have for retirement, paying off your mortgage, second home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's really the whole point about this. Um, <clears throat> whether it comes from financial aid or it comes from the tax code, that's another aspect that I just want to briefly mention before we conclude here. If you are, for example, a high-income business owner and you're not going to qualify for need-based aid, there are still are other things that you could benefit from to save for college, but they're going to come from the tax code. So there's something called a Section 127 plan, which allows you to deduct $5,250 per employee. So if you put your kids on payroll, you might be able to pay for college, you know, a little bit of college with pre-tax dollars. The thing about this type of uh, strategic stuff, it's the opposite of need-based planning because in need-based planning, you, want, you don't want money in the kids' names, but for tax planning for high-income business owners, you do want the money in the kids' names. The question is, you know, how do you determine which path to follow? And that's, that's something that we've developed an expertise on. Um, stuff that, you know, I can tell you about tax-wise that, you know, I'm not a CPA, but, um, you know, we're, we're uh, almost experts on <laughs> is, um, you know, you've got the American Opportunity Credit, which phases out above a certain income, but you can deduct 2500 bucks. You've got the Lifetime Learning Credit, which I think is $1,800 or $2,200, depends. Um, but bottom line, talk to your CPA about any types of, just ask the question, like what am I able to deduct? What types of credits are there for me? My kids are going to college soon. Just ask your CPA that. And if your CPA can't answer that, you need a new CPA. Final comments. If college is an investment, then there should be a return on investment. Not just going to school and winging it. You need to there's two components to return on investment. One is going for the lowest price possible, which we talked about here. And the second component, which is equally important, and we didn't talk about this here, is it should prepare you for success in the next 40 years. Um, big piece of advice I have for everyone, I urge you to be strategic about this. Don't just wing it or just focus on the tactics. So what's the difference between a strategy and a tactic? 
strategy is sort of a principle. Like, okay, this is what I'm majoring. These are the types of things I need to do in order to get into a you know a, a top school. But I'm these are the types of schools I'm going to apply to because I'm going to be able to get financial aid awards like you know Syracuse versus USC and play them off against each other. A tactic is I'm going to take the SAT five times and I'm going to keep taking it until I get my you know uh, I'm going to I'm going to write my college essay sixteen times. That's a tactic. There's, there's no strategy behind it. And over understand the value of overlooked or hidden gem colleges. There are four thousand colleges out there. Your guidance counselor probably recommends the same twenty five or thirty to each kid. And that's a shame. And um, part of that is the guidance counselor's fault. You know, I'm not, I'm not bashing them, but uh, it is true. And part of that is the family's fault. They're just not willing to, to consider that maybe some schools that are not playing football or basketball on Saturday afternoon on television are not, you know, are not necessarily the best for the kid. Next steps. If you want to talk to us about any of this stuff, how you can get scholarships and grants, how you can identify a set of best fit colleges at the right price, how your child can get in, even if he has the same grades and scores as 5,000 other competitor applicants, then what we're going to offer you, and this is, um, I'm not just saying this to, uh, as a gimmick, this is a, uh, this is real. You can talk to us for free. You can set up a, um, you can set up a conference call. We call it a strategy session. It's not face-to-face. -face. It's a phone call because I don't have time to do face-to-face. -face. It is free. But I'm, uh, I've been discussing this for a while with Pearl. We're planning to stop offering the free calls. So the best bet for you is to, if you're interested, is to sometime like now, but, but, but between now and the next three weeks, if you get on the calendar, you don't have to, we don't have to talk in the next three weeks, but if you get on the calendar, I can promise you sometime in the next three weeks it'll be free. It's first come, first served. A lot of times people wait two or three weeks you know, for their appointment to come up. But um, the way you do that, if you're interested, is you either go on the site where we have the calendar, which is consultwithandy.com, or you can call the main number and just leave a message. Do not, do not email Pearl now. Do not, you know, do it any other way because we, we're a small firm heading out of town also for a conference, and uh, we need to rely on these systems in order for us to be able to um, manage all the crushing uh, workload that, um, Pearl suffers from not me of course I don't really do any work so thanks a lot I hope you found this valuable um, it was uh, it did my best to give you you know information I don't get a chance normally to talk about at my uh, at my free um, live workshops although I, I think this was review for some of you guys you know the way I look at it, the best phrase I ever heard is like life is a sort of a spiral staircase Meaning that as you go up, well, hopefully you're going up, not down. But as you go up, you, you come back to the same perspective, uh, same point, but you're, you have a different perspective. So even if this was review for you, I hope you found that you know, found value. But um, the 30% or so that was new stuff, I hope you uh, appreciate that. And again, if you have any questions, we are available. If you're interested in you know coming up with your own college plan, that's how you do it. Just book here in terms of what would happen on that call is that there's no structure, there's no format. It's really your opportunity to fire anything, any type of question away at me. Um, I prefer college-related questions, but um, it's, you know, it's whatever you want to do, ho however you want to spend the 20 minutes with me. Um, I will try to determine whether or not I can help you. And like I said at the outset, we can't help everyone. And um, there's certainly a minority of people that we could help, but we don't want to help. We just don't want to work with them because... <laughs> Who knows, personality conflict, or they don't laugh at my jokes or something. But um, there's no pressure to do anything. It's not a, some sort of sales pitch or something. Most of the time, if it turns out that you would be a good candidate for us, then the next step would be to set up a, a free face-to-face, -face, either in the office or, or some other location. But that's really it. So thanks a lot for watching. Um, we're going to wrap up here. And uh, um, please send us your comments, and we're available. For, uh, for, for a limited time. Talk to you soon. And Pearl, thank you for your assistance. She's giving me the thumbs up. All right. Bye, everybody.